Hello and welcome back. This is the Chapter 3 video lecture over momentum and energy out of the Conceptual Physical Science book. Let's get started. So in this lecture we're going to help you understand these topics, momentum and impulse. Impulse changes momentum, how that works. Conservation of momentum, energy and work, the work energy theorem, conservation of energy, power, machines, efficiency, and sources of energy. <clears throat> well, what is momentum exactly? We can define momentum as inertia in motion. This is defined as the product of the mass and velocity. So momentum equals mass times velocity. Now, when direction is not important, we can substitute velocity for speed. Because speed does not have a direction to it, and so that's velocity as speed. Now in momentum, a high mass or a high velocity will equal high momentum. And a high mass and a high velocity will equal a higher momentum. Or a low mass or a low velocity, you'll have a low momentum. It's kind of like how much energy is involved in this motion. You can have a very big rock going slowly, it'll still crush you. Or you can have uh, a bullet with low mass but high velocity, it's going to do some bad stuff to you. So impulse is a little different. Impulse takes into consideration the force times the time. And so you have, if you have a great force for a long time, this is a large impulse. If you have the same force for a short time, a smaller impulse. And so impulse can change momentum. And so the change uh, we uh, notate with this Greek letter delta right here. And so force times time is equal of a change in momentum. And we'll see how that works. <clears throat> so if we apply a great force for a long period of time, this will produce a great increase in momentum. So here are some examples. A golfer falls through while teeing off. Lots of momentum. Long barrels of long-range cannons will do that. Driving into a haystack versus a brick wall. That's going to be decreasing momentum. Jumping in a safety net versus onto a solid ground will have a different momentum. If you have a car out of control, it's better to hit a haystack than the concrete wall. Common sense, but with a physics reason. It's the same impulse, but hitting the haystack reduces the forces over a longer period of time, so it slows it down gently. Whereas the strict wall, it will force you to stop quickly. Just like in jumping, if you bend your knees when your feet make contact with the ground, you'll be like that haystack, your cushion is soft. Now here's another example of impulse changing momentum. A short time interval produces a large force. Here she is breaking these concrete slabs or bricks with her arm. <coughs> she does it very quickly but with a lot of force and that ends up breaking the concrete. And so in every case, the momentum of the system cannot change unless it is acted upon by outside forces. Does that sound familiar from Newton? It sure does. A system will have to have the same momentum both before and after any interaction occurs. And when the momentum does not change, we say that is conserved. And so the law of conservation of momentum says this. In the absence of an external force, the momentum of a system remains unchanged. The momentum before has to equal, equal the momentum afterwards. When objects collide in the absence of external forces, we have a, examples of this. We call these elastic and inelastic collisions. In an elastic collision, this is where objects collide without permanent deformation or the generation of heat, where we have like these bouncing balls together. In an inelastic collision, this is where these train cars collide and stay together and link up. And then this is an inelastic collision. They don't bounce off. They, we call it sticky. 
Now let's take a look at the definition of work. We define work as the product of the force exerted on an object and the distance the object moves in the same direction of the force. Work is done only when the force succeeds in moving the body it acts upon. Work is equal to force times distance. And two things enter in where work is done. Application of a force and the movement of something by that force. Work done on this barbell is the average force multiplied by the distance to which the barbell was lifted. Okay, so we can quantify this in two categories. Work can be done against another force or work can be done to change the speed of an object. So work and energy and power are all related but they're different. Energy is defined as that which produces change in matter. So the effects of energy are observed only when it is being transferred from one place to another, or it is being transformed from one form to another form. We call this unit we talk about with both work and energy, it's measured in the unit of joules. Now look at power. Power is a measure of how fast work is done, and the equation is the amount of work done and divided by the time it took you to do it. And we call this unit of power a watt. And you are very familiar with this, but like the electric system, uh, when you get your electric bill in the mail, they talk about how many watts or kilowatts per hour you use. Okay, now we're going to throw a lot of new terms at you here. Here are two more terms, potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy has to do with the height and mass of an object. <clears throat> and so it is basically stored energy by its position. The higher up the mass, the more potential energy it has to do. When you have it in a gravitational field, it's called gravitational potential energy. And we can look at the equation for this. Uh, potential energy is basically weight times height. Or we can substitute in the mass with the gravitation constant, g. And potential energy equals mgh, mass, gravitational constant, and height. So more mass or more height, you get more potential energy. And here's that work energy theorem we talked about. It applies to decreasing the speed of an object. It reduces the speed of an object or bringing it to a halt. An example would be the applying of brakes to slow a moving car down. Work is done on it, the friction force supplied by the brakes. Well, now let's look at kinetic energy. And kinetic energy basically is energy in motion. It is defined as the energy of a moving body. The equation is one half the mass times the velocity squared. A small change in speed will equal a large change in kinetic energy. So back to the work energy theorem. If work is done on an object to change its kinetic energy, then the amount of work done is equal to that change in kinetic energy. They have to equalize. If there's no change in the object's energy, there's no work to be done on the object. So energy is conserved either through potential energy or kinetic energy in motion. Now let's look at machines. Machines are a product of conservation of energy where we have the work input being put into that machine is going to be equal to the work output. And one of the things that we can't build is the perpetual engine where we have a recurring of more output than we do input. What you put into the machine has to be what gets out of the machine, minus any friction that's incurred and heat loss. So comparisons of kinetic energy and momentum here, they both depend on mass and velocity. Momentum depends on mass and velocity also. Kinetic energy depends on mass and the square of the velocity or speed. So conservation is defined in everyday language as, quote, quote, to save to keep, and physics as to remain unchanged. So here's the law of conservation of energy defined. 
In the absence of an external work input or output, the energy of a system remains unchanged. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, and that's critical key in this chapter. And I repeat it again, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So here is a situation to look at. Consider the system of a bow and arrow. In drawing a bow back, we do work on the system and give it potential energy. Okay? When the bowstring is released, most of the potential energy is transferred to the arrow as kinetic energy in motion. And we lose some as heat to the bow. So here's the question. Suppose the potential energy of a drawn bow is 50 joules and the kinetic energy of the shot arrow is 40 joules. Which one of these is going to be considered correct? Energy is not conserved. 10 joules goes to warming the bow. 10 joules goes to warming the target. Or 10 joules is mysteriously missing. Let's see if we can get an answer on this. Well, we put 50 in. We get 40 out, so that means there's 10 that goes somewhere else, and it's usually generated in heat as we convert from stable motion to kinetic motion in, in uh, energy, and so that goes to the bow. We lose that as heat. Machines are a device for multiplying force or changing the direction of a force. And take note here that no machine can put out more energy than is put into it, the perpetual engine. To create energy, it can only transfer or transform energy from one form to another, maybe chemical to heat. And we'll let's skip that. Efficiency is how effective a device transforms or transfers useful energy. So efficiency is basically the work done divided by the energy used times 100%. And so some energy is always dissipated as heat. So that means no machine is ever 100% efficient, making the perpetual engine not logical to do. So here are some sources of energy from the sun. You get a lot of energy from the sun. The sunlight evaporates water. Water falls as rain. Rain flows into rivers and into generator turbines and then back to the sea, and we repeat the cycle. Solar energy can also transform into electricity by uh, solar cells. Solar energy indirectly produces wind, which can power turbines and generate electricity. So these are forms of different types of energy transformation. We can have a dry rock geothermal power as a producer of electricity, and you might see some Businesses or homes now that use geothermal power, they basically use the temperature of the soil and the rock and the ground. And it's cooler in the summer, the ground is, and so that generates cooler water going through the pumps in the ground to help air condition a building. And the reverse is true in the winter where the ground is warmer than the outside air, and so the warm water goes through to generate heat in a building. Solar power. The power available in sunlight is about one kilowatt per square meter, and we see this in uh, solar panels, hydroelectric turbines and dams, wind turbines, and bio-based fuels. We also see it in electricity, synthetic fuels that can be created from bio-based products from plants, and hydrogen, which is slowly becoming a source of energy. Uh, not as a source, but it can be generated from multiple sources and is a good fuel for fuel cells or combustion engines. So we can create hydrogen when an electric current passes through conducting water. Bubbles of hydrogen form at one wire and oxygen at the other wire, and this is called electrolysis. And you'll remember that water is basically what chemical equation is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. So we're separating those two. And finally, hydrogen fuel, power harvested by the photovoltaic cells, the solar cells, can be used to separate hydrogen for fuel cell transportation. Not really big in the United States right now, it's really big in Europe though. Plans for trains that run on solar power collected on railroad track ties are presently in the planning stages, and again, Europe is leading this effort. And that's it for chapter three.